Today I'm looking at two of the most underrated hot hatches of the 1980s, the cars that took on the mantle of the old Mini Cooper into the 1980s. This is an MG Metro 1300. It isn't a hot hatch, it's a warm hatch. That would be this, an MG Metro Turbo. The Austin Mini Metro was launched in October 1980 to massive fanfare, being the car that would take over from the Mini as British Leyland's mass market small car and it was bloody successful. Over 17 years in production, they made over 2 million of the things. Between 1981 and 1983, it was Britain's most popular car. After that, it was eclipsed by the Ford Fiesta. The Metro was restyled shortly before its release by my favourites, Harris Mann, the fellow who designed the TR7 and the Princess, and David Batch, who designed cars like the P6 and the Range Rover. And I think these are great looking little cars. Straight lines, very simple styling, quite utilitarian really, but I think they look utterly wonderful. On Ford's side of the market, you could have the Fiesta XR2, which when introduced in 1981 was a limited edition and was a proper little hot hatch with its 1.6 litre 82 brake horsepower engine, spot lamps and alloy wheels. At the same time, John Cooper had got his mitts on a brand new Metro and went about creating his own true successor to the Mini Cooper, his Metro Cooper. That car didn't last very long as BL never gave it their blessing. So in 1982, the MG Metro 1300 and later the MG Metro Turbo arrived. The 1300 produced 72 brake horsepower and the Turbo 94, straddling Ford's market on each side of the XR2's 82 brake horsepower. The MG Metro was the comeback of the famous MG Octagon after BL pulled the plug on the MGB and the MG Midget in 1980. The MG Metro came out in 1982, two years after the original Metro, and in 1983 it was joined by the Maestro and then in 84 by the Montego to complete the hot side of the Austin Rover range. Now this design of the original Metro is something that's really appreciated over time. Uh, in the mid, mid to late 90s for example these cars weren't exactly desirable, but now they're certainly becoming a lot more desirable and this 80s boxy style is really appreciating. And if we look at the differences between this and a normal Metro, we see obviously the MG badge on the front and these little red strips along the top of the bottom of the grille. You have this coach line down the side and below it, these snazzy 80s graphics saying MG Metro. These awesome pepper pot wheels, which I absolutely love. These are 12 inch wheels, which are tiny by modern standards, but are just right for a Metro. Of course, this one has a sunroof which is fantastic, but will probably leak. And you also get this little spoiler at the back, which does reduce drag, makes this car a little bit more fuel efficient and also makes it a little bit quicker. In fact, the economy metros later on also got this rear spoiler just to make them a little bit more economical. Tying in with the spoiler, this bit of the boot lid here is painted black. And you get again, the same graphic down here that says MG Metro 1300. And of course, you get the awesome, rorty little exhaust, the noise of which I'll show you in a minute. And the turbo looks a lot beefier than the standard 1300. You have this chin spoiler at the front, and of course the extended wheel arches of the turbo. Of course, the side graphics say turbo in massive letters because that's the most important thing in the 1980s. You get different wheel trims to the 1300. They should say MG in the middle of them, but don't. Again, on the rear, rear arch, you get these little bumper things at the back. The same awesome exhaust. Different badging on the back to say turbo. So the turbo looks an awful lot beefier than the standard 1300 when you get them alongside each other. The standard MG 1300 does look quite a lot like a normal Metro really, just with graphics on the side of it. I don't think that's a bad thing. I really like the look of the 1300. I prefer it to the turbo but the turbo just looks like it's got a bit more to it. Now I'll come to the interior mainly in a bit, but enhancing that MG style, you get red carpets, red piping on the seats, and of course, red seat belts. Lovely jubbly. Making that 72 brake horsepower is something very familiar to anybody who owns a Mini. It's the venerable old A-Series engine here in 1275cc form, 
very similar to that in the 1275 Mini Cooper S from the 60s, but with a single carb and a different head. And this is an A-plus engine. But apart from that, 72 rec horsepower does not sound like a lot. And to be honest, it isn't. But the car weighs 776 kilos. That's less than half the weight of a modern Vauxhall Corsa. So 72 brake horsepower is plenty. The turbo makes 94 thanks to a little Garrett turbocharger bolted onto the same 1275cc block. Austin Rover were going to have this car make quite a bit more than 94, but they didn't have the resources to make a gearbox that could handle the extra power, so the turbo had to make do with its 94 brake horsepower. Underneath the engine in the sump is a 4-speed manual gearbox that loves to eat its own synchromesh. Suspension wise, all metros run on Dr. Alex Moulton's hydrogas system, which one day I'll probably talk about properly as I'm doing so many cars that use this suspension. Either way, there is a fluid for damping and a gas for springing, so no springs or shocks in an MG Metro, just floating on fluid. I love the way this little car looks. As I've already said, it's a very simple, straight edge design, but it is very elegant and cute. The lines in the doors echo the Rover SD1 launched four years prior, while the angle of this boot lid was designed to look more like a coupe than an estate, as some early super minis did. That was also something that early Metro prototypes were criticised for. Inside the 1300 is a 17 year old's dream down to these fantastic red seat belts and the piping in these seats and the colour and the pattern. This is fantastic. You also get this sporty three spoke steering wheel with the MG Octagon in the middle and these fantastic dials that are stylized compared to the ones in the normal Metro. Again, complete with MG logo in the middle. The instrumentation is pretty standard. You have speedometer, you have tachometer with a digital clock in it. You have coolant temperature, fuel level, and an array of warning lights at the bottom. This dashboard is completely basic and quite stark, but it does have an enormous T-shelf. In the middle, you get an ashtray and your cigarette lighter is down here. You get your heater controls, which are all here alongside these two vents. You don't get vents at the side, only those little tiny window ones and the screen ones. So you have a two-speed fan. You have obviously your heat, direction, etc. And underneath it, you have a stereo radio cassette. And the stalks feel quite flimsy, really. You have your horn on the end here, which is standard Metro horn. And you have the indicators, left and right. And then your flash. Now, these, these stalks feel really quite flimsy. Below there, you have your lights your manual choke, of course, and your lock. Uh, on the, and then on the right-hand side, you have your wipers. So you have your speeds there, you have your wash by push it, pushing the end there, etc. And your other wiper, your rear one, is down here. That's on, and that's for wash. Again, down here, you get a couple more controls. There is your rear fog light, your hazard switch, which lights up and heated rear screen. On the doors, you get these little pockets here and speakers down there. You have wind up windows, of course, and your door handle here. But this lovely pattern and the red strip going through it there as you're only getting an MG. Mirror control is from the inside through this little stalk here. You get twin sun visors and they come with mirrors as well because it's luxury you have a dome light 
you have a four speed gearbox, which has a very weird throw, but anyone who has an A series will know all about that. You have a handbrake, which has a grip on it, unlike my Metro, because MG. On the turbo version, you get a turbo steering wheel, and instead of a clock, you get a boost gauge, because ultimate child, and your clock is in the middle instead. You even get red stitching around the inside of the steering wheel. Just brilliant. Now there's quite a lot of room in the front of the 1300 here. I mean, the steering wheel is quite far away from me just because of the angle it sits, but there's plenty of room for my legs on the pedals, and there's plenty of room for the passenger too. And again, there's quite a bit of headroom. So this is a small car on the outside, but on the inside, there's plenty enough room for anyone. Now in the back, you don't get very much here. You certainly don't get any headrests, but you do get grab handles. Uh, there isn't an awful lot of room here. I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable here, and this seat is further back than I would sit. Um, the person who owns this car is slightly taller than I am, but there isn't any room there. But again, it is perfectly comfortable. I might not want to be here for a really long journey, but it's fine for really short ones. And again, I have a good amount of room for my head. It feels very, very airy in here because of these massive windows, which do pop out actually. If I can reach around and show you this. Rear windows pop out. Very cool. I wish my Metro had them. That's brilliant. Of, of course, no rear seat belts in this one because it's a 1982, this one. And so that just doesn't exist in this, in this day and age. Because it's the 80s, you get an ashtray on both sides in the back which flips out like that. And you get this little storage tray here, although I'm not really sure what you can get in it. Quite disappointingly, you can't press the boot open, you have to use the key. But once it is open, there's loads of room in here. You have your jack hooked up there. Underneath you get a full size spare wheel, but you can't see it there. But there is a lot of room for a very small car in the boot of these. Uh, you know, I could certainly get in it and be perfectly comfortable in there. Now I'm just gonna start this car up and just show you the fantastic noise it makes. So I need a little bit of choke, probably. Well, even though that idle is a little bit low because I've taken the choke off a bit too quickly, that exhaust sounds fantastic. Now for the way this car drives. And to be honest, metros are wonderful. But if you've seen the video I've done in my own metro, you will already know that. The differences between the suspension setups in the two cars is noticeable, with the MG being a little bit harsher and bouncier. But the handling is still sharp, direct, neutral and an enormous laugh. As you've already seen, the engine makes a lovely little noise with that raspy exhaust and it loves to be worked but the gearbox is a tiny bit of a sore point if you're coming from a modern car. There's lots of sideways throw between second and third, and it doesn't love to be thrashed through the gears in a hurry, but it's still bloody brilliant fun. To sum up, if you love the way minis drive, then you'll also love the way the Metro drives. They're small, cute, easy to drive, neutral, direct, sound great, and an utter pleasure to throw around B-roads. So that is the MG Metro 1300 and the MG Metro Turbo. One day when I get my hands on an early Austin Metro, I'll show you about the development in the history of the Metro as a car. But for now, please like the video, subscribe, comment, etc. And hopefully I will see you again.